Now we're moving on to our Burkholderia species, and we're going to start with Burkholderia mallei. Um, this is the cause of glanders, and it primarily affects equids. Um, now, humans and cats are also susceptible if exposed or if our uh, fed glanderous meat. Transmission is by ingestion of food or water that's been contaminated by nasal discharges, so horses drinking out of the same uh, water trough, for instance. And Burkholderia mallei is a facultative intracellular parasite, um, so it hides out from the immune system, and it actually spreads from cell to cell in a manner that's quite similar to Listeria monocytogenes. In horses, we see three forms of the disease, with glanders being either pulmonary or nasal. And then we have another name for the cutaneous disease, uh, which is farsi. Acute disease, acute more severe disease, is more common in donkeys and mules than in horses. And it begins with pyrexia, depression, and anorexia. So they are an unhappy horse. Watery discharge. Um, is then seen from the nostril, which is oftentimes unilateral, and they may be coughing. Nodules and ulcerations then develop on the nasal septum, and that discharge becomes thicker. So it goes from watery to perhaps mucopurulent. You're going to see enlargement of the regional lymph nodes. And in animals who survive this state, we can actually get perforation of the nasal septum. So it can be a very uh, deeply ulcerative, erosive lesion. In these images here, um, on the left, you can see this uh, lymphadenopathy, so enlarged lymph nodes on the neck of a donkey. Here we have a horse with ocular discharge. I think you can see his eye is swollen, and perhaps there's some tears running down the front of the face. And then on the right, we have a necropsy collected specimen um, of the nasal septum. And I think you can appreciate these areas of thickened mucosa followed by really deep ulcerations. We can also see cutaneous lesions, um, oftentimes presenting as nodules on the inner thighs, limbs, and belly, like you can see on this horse down here. These nodules are due to uh, lymphadenopathies, so we get lymphadenitis, or swelling of the lymph nodes, and lymphangitis, or swelling of the lymph vessels between those nodes. Uh, the nodules may then ulcerate, and they're frequently seen as a line running along the tracks of lymphatics in the skin. In other species, glanders is oftentimes fatal within several weeks. Um, carnivores, so particularly large cats that are fled, fed glanderous meat in zoos are susceptible, as are camels. Burkholderia mallei is not found in North America, so this would be considered a foreign animal disease. It is present in Asia, the Middle East, South America, and Russia. And this, these differences in geographic distribution are one of the important reasons for strict import controls on equine products, including both semen and serum. Burkholderia mallei is a potential bioweapon, and it's actually been used in the past by the Germans in World War I and Japanese in World War II. I've put a link to a video above, which describes the impact of the use of this bioweapon on a population in China. Burkholderia pseudomallei, the cause of melioidosis, uh, is found primarily in the tropics. We think of this occurring in particularly Southeast Asia, so Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, Laos, and also parts of Northern Australia. It causes a glanders-like disease called melioidosis, and just like Burkholderia mallei, it's an intracellular pathogen. Unlike Burkholderia mallei, Pseudomallei has a broad host range, and animals or people are infected uh, through contaminated food or water. It's generally associated with sort of muddy water and human soils, so places like rice paddies are where individuals are frequently exposed and infected. Although we can see infections following consumption of infected animals, so contaminated meat. Exposure is oftentimes occupational, so laborers, cleaners, or like I just said, rice paddy workers. In this map, you can see the distribution of Burkholderia pseudomallei, with the countries and regions highlighted in red as highly endemic regions. So again, Southeast Asia and Northern Australia. Sporadic cases occur in the countries in yellow, so other parts of uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, as well as South and Central America. And you'll notice that here in Canada, we do not have Burkholderia pseudomallei. 
These are some pictures that I took of the countryside surrounding Siem Reap, Cambodia, and I think you can appreciate just how widespread things like uh, rice paddies and lotus ponds are. Uh, agricultural workers who aren't wearing personal protective equipment, so essentially rubber boots, are potentially at risk of exposure to Burkholderia pseudomallei uh, when walking through this water. In people, many infections with pseudomallei are self-limiting. It's simply a flu-like illness. In more severely affected individuals, we see abscesses, which can occur really anywhere in the body. Um, the lungs and brain are the most common site in people. And it's really important to know that these infections can be latent and reactivate years later. Following the Vietnam War, um, high rates of Burkholderia pseudomallei infections were reported among U.S. soldiers who had returned. In people, there's three distinct forms of malleidosis. In acute disease, we see septicemia with metastatic lesions and abscesses. In the subacute form, it's tuberculosis-like. So we see pneumonia and lymphangitis. And then in the chronic form, we can see localized chronic cellulitis, which can persist for years. Burkholderia pseudomallei is intrinsically resistant to many antimicrobials, so it's very challenging to treat. And partially as a consequence of this, the mortality rate of infections is very, very high. Um, even in developed countries, so in Northern Australia, um, patients who are bacteremic with Burkholderia pseudomallei have a mortality rate of about 19%. I've put a link to a video above which describes the situation with Burkholderia mallei in Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand. This organism has been reported in numerous animal species, so ruminants, pigs, horses, deer, camels, dogs, dolphins, koala, kangaroo, as well as non-human primates. And the disease can be either rapidly fatal or subclinical. In horses, it can mimic glanders and look quite similar. In sheep and goats, we see respiratory and CNS infections, as well as arthritis and mastitis. And in dogs, it most commonly presents as localized abscessations with pyrexia. So they have an abscess and a fever at the same time. These two images are both of pig spleens. On the left, we have one from Queensland, Australia. And on the right here, we have a pig spleen from uh, Thailand. Both of these are regions where we know Burkholderia pseudomallei is endemic. In this image, you can see necrosuppurative meningoencephalitis um, in a case of neurologic meliodosis in a macaque. So here we have the lesions here, some abnormal, perhaps purulent material, and hemorrhagic lesions on the surface of the brain. Reportedly, and perhaps not surprisingly, this animal was displaying neurological signs anti-mortem. Um, and again, this macaque was housed in Thailand. For Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Stenotrophomonas, you want to collect samples as per usual from the site of infection. In cases of uh, fish or uh, septic ectotherms, perhaps sending in the whole animal would be useful. For Burkholderia mallei, if you find yourself practicing in an endemic region, it is important to protect yourself. You must, must, must wear gloves. This is an important zoonosis. And you want to be collecting discharges from lesions for culture and blood for serology. This is an image of the Malian test for glanders from just over 100 years ago, where horses would be tested for exposure to the organism by inoculating a small uh, fraction of uh, Burkholderia mallei protein into the eye. If the horse developed an inflammatory response, you would know that the animal had been exposed and was potentially infected. Pseudomonas and stenotrophomonas will readily grow on routine test media, so blood and McConkie. Uh, similarly, Burkholderia mallei and pseudomallei will also grow on blood and McConkie. Um, these organisms can actually be identified based on their colony morphology. It's fairly characteristic. PCR-based assays are also critically important for these organisms. They are level three, and so non-propagative tests are safer for diagnosticians to perform. Immunological tests, so serology for pseudomallei, uh, can be done, although we do have cross-reactivity between these two species. Non-fermenters, other than Pseudomonas aeruginosa, can be notoriously difficult to identify to the species level, and Malditoff doesn't always do a great job. So in cases where you really need a species-level ID, 
using molecular techniques or something like uh, sequencing of a, a universal target like 16S or CPN60 can be a very useful adjunctive test. Human infections with Burkholderia mallei are zoonotic. They are always zoonotic. And those people at greatest risk include veterinarians, those working with horses, lab workers, or abattoir workers. And of course, these are people in endemic regions. Pseudomallei is not typically transmitted between animals or from animals into people. It's more commonly acquired from the environment. Although if you were to eat an animal who died of Burkholderia pseudomallei um, and the meat was improperly cooked, that could certainly be a risk factor as well. Bergiella zuhelcum, um, this is a non-fermenter that's been found in dog mouths and possibly in bite wounds. Um, the reason I mention it is that as a non-fermenter, it's intrinsically resistant to many antibiotics and so can be quite difficult to treat. Treatment of these infections really depends on which one you're dealing with. In Canada, glanders is an immediately notifiable disease, and so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency would have to be notified, and authorities would take a stamping out approach. So any affected animals and possibly those in contact would be humanely euthanized and safely disposed of. Pseudomonas and stenotrophomonas really need to be treated based on the results of susceptibility testing. Um, there are cases where topical therapies may be very useful. So in dogs with otitis externa, you may be much more likely to have success treating with something like Burroughs solution rather than an antimicrobial based preparation. There is a lot of intrinsic resistance among these bacteria. Um, it's partially due to the low levels of porin expression in the cell membrane. And so antibiotics simply aren't able to penetrate and reach their site of infection. Here we have the intrinsic resistance table from UCAST. And you can see, for instance, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, intrinsically resistant to uh, ampicillin and amoxicillin, as well as potentiated ampinamox, so with clavulanic acid or sulbactam, some of our third generation cephalosporins, ertapenem, chloramphenicol, trimethoprim, tetracycline, and tigacycline. So a lot of intrinsic resistance, which greatly limits uh, our therapeutic options. Just one new term for today, and of course, some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.